Hello and welcome to the Sci-Fi 2021 panel, the antitrust debate in the US. I'm Nikila Natrajan, Senior Program Manager for Media and Digital Content at Observer Research Foundation America and a PhD student in Media Studies and Communications. It is my pleasure to introduce our panelists today, Marit Shake, who Politico calls, quote, a voice to listen to on both sides of the Atlantic on how to regulate technology. Mariche is International Policy Director at Stanford University's Cyber Policy Center, along with all of the other hats she wears. Uh, my colleague, Abigail Lawson, Associate Fellow and Program Manager, ORF America. And finally, Professor William Kovacic. He's a former chair of the Federal Trade Commission. So our brief today is to apply our collective knowledge to some questions, notably the changing relationship between Capitol Hill and Silicon Valley, what does the activist approach to economic competition represented by Timothy Wu and other Biden officials, including Lena Khan, mean for the collision between big tech and regulators? So what we'll do right now is we'll go around the room to kick things off and we'll begin with Mariche. Uh, Mariche, when we spoke last, it was just after the Jan 6th storming of the US Capitol, I remember. And mm -hmm. it always seems to get creepier every time we meet. Here we are now with crushing new revelations from the latest round of Congress hearings that eight-year-olds, yes, we heard that right, eight-year-olds are being used in market research. The way we experience antitrust, at least I do, is we are the effects that result from the lack of regulation. And in many ways, Europe is the only functioning regulator of Silicon Valley, in a sense. You told uh, Yuval Noah Harari at that conversation in Athens, but how there's been too much assumption in the effects that technology would have hope uh, and them in, in and of themselves would be liberalizing. And therefore, there has been very little deliberate governing. Um, I'll toss it over to you. What, how are you thinking through this today? Well, thank you for having me. And there's already so much in your question that I'll try to unpack it a little. I agree. I think we are still in a moment where the outsized power of tech companies, big but also smaller ones, if we think about the spyware sector, for example, can cause enormous harms, whether it is to our public and political debates, whether it is to youngsters, or whether it is to our democratic process. The trust that people have, uh, are their willingness and their ability to exercise their democratic rights, uh, there really are a, a number of harms that we can see coming from uh, under-regulated tech companies. Now, you talked about antitrust, and I think uh, competition law antitrust measures are immensely forceful. Uh, the mandates for regulators are strong, and the laws are clear and in many ways uncontroversial. So you will see that people from multiple sides of the political spectrum actually think that fairness in the economy is important. And that may explain why so many people are looking with high hopes and maybe sometimes uh, extremely high hopes to what antitrust enforcement can do to right all those wrongs and those harms that uh, I just mentioned a couple of. So while I believe antitrust enforcement is critical and I see that there need to be updates to uh, decades old, century old laws that actually foresee in the pillars of our uh, competition and antitrust rules in Europe, in the United States, they need to be updated. Um, but I also do not think that antitrust regulations alone, even if they are stretched, updated, uh, enforced, can solve all the problems that the under-regulated tech sector is causing. So antitrust to me is a core pillar, but is not the only thing that we need to make sure that public interests, uh, democratic rights, human rights, uh, protection of children are uh, ensured in a digital age. I'll just pick up from there, since you're saying, OK, it's a core pillar. Um, the mandate is pretty strong, and we've seen that in the July 9th executive order uh, from the Biden administration. So what are those other pillars? Well, for example, I believe that rights protections online, data governance, including uh, data privacy and uh, the, the uh, questions about um, uh, data protection are really important, um, but also if you look at the horizontal question of 
public interest versus private governance, there's a long list of issues that we need to be very concerned about. For example, outsourcing the defense of the homeland, national security protection to software companies leads to new types of vulnerabilities where the responsibilities are not clear. Uh, there seems to be almost a blind trust in the fact that these software companies are responsible for protecting databases, sensitive information, critical infrastructure. But the reality is not that rosy. In fact, we see breach after breach, scandal after scandal, hack after hack, intrusion after intrusion. So getting clarity about where public authorities, democratic governments are primarily responsible and making sure that the oversight and the sort of chains of command, for lack of better term, are clear, is also really important. So the way I approach the, the massively complex and large question of what needs to happen now is to really go back to core principles of, you know, public interest, national security, public health, a public debate, democratic rights, uh, to make sure that we're not sort of distracted uh, in a way about um, what needs to happen if we look only at this or that technology, this or that incident, but that we actually see that there's a systematic power shift happening from public authorities to private tech companies, and that that systems challenge needs to be addressed and uh, the, the shift in power manifests itself in different ways, but it can be brought back to the big question of what is the proper role of commercial tech companies and how do we make sure that there are countervailing powers to their outsized power? Yeah, because now it's increasingly just the the device itself, right? Spyware, for instance, it's, it's not just technology or that. They take your own entire device, they can see it. I mean, and you talked about NSO with UL, so I, I was just kind of so, uh, yeah. Reminded, yeah. reminded of that. Um, some questions arise from what you said, but let's go to uh, Abigail now. Abigail, um, you are working on content moderation, we know, and you are approaching that through the lens of power, essentially. So uh, until we are joined by Professor Kowisik and we ask him how it works from the inside, uh, tell us what you've been finding. Yeah, uh, thank you, Nikki. So um, a lot of what Marita just said resonates with, with uh, how I've been thinking about this uh, antitrust debate and related issues of competition um, in the content moderation and online speech uh, space, uh, which is also reflects this sort of power dynamic often framed as a two-way struggle for power between governments and big tech companies. And um, as Marita said, I mean, um, Governments have been upset about the amount of power amassed by big tech, and there's been really good reason for that. There's a lot of these negative um, impacts. They've been reckless with user data. They've used their uh, market power and size to eat up uh, competitors and rig the rules in their favor. And they've um, exercised essentially an unprecedented degree of control over the social and political discourse um, through their content moderation and, and algorithms without a lot of accountability for how they do that. And so I certainly, um, you know, think that there's cause for concern anytime this much influence is concentrated in the hands of a few unelected, unaccountable corporate entities, um, and that we do need a various, uh, a, a wide range of regulations uh, cross-cutting a lot of the areas that Marija mentioned. Um, I do think as we approach uh, different regulatory efforts and, and legislative proposals, it is important to make sure that these efforts are not just about um, governments seizing authorities that they think should belong to them. Uh, for example, the ability to conduct mass surveillance, which is attractive to a lot of, of politicians or government agencies, um, or to conduct their own censorship or control the political discourse in a way that they see fit, but rather that these um, regulatory efforts are really focused on redistributing uh, uh, decision-making and, and power back into the hands of users and citizens. And that can be through um, um, democratic institutions, but also just promoting more user choice and um, option and control um, as they interact with these platforms in particular, um, and talking about social media. So uh, what this means, uh, I think it can mean a lot of things. <laughs> um, 
a lot of different different regulations and, and uh, efforts, but um, I think it fundamentally means that we need more transparency and clarity on the part of companies as well as governments about actions that are being taken with regard to user content. Um, I think it means that users need more information about where they're spending their time online and what the rules are that govern those spaces and what routes for recourse exist when decisions are taken regarding their online activity. And where this comes in with antitrust, um, and I know we'll get more into that, but uh, as Marie just said, I, I, it's, it's not going to solve all the problems that are coming from, from big tech and certainly not all of the speech-related problems that we see coming from or exacerbated by widespread social media use and the, and the business model that a lot of these companies use. Um, but I do think it is a, a core piece. I think improving competition can help provide more choice for users. I think antitrust cases can help provide a check on the amount of power that one company can accrue. Um, and I think that some of these cases can help us think um, creatively about the different markets in which these companies operate and come up with new, new models based on that. Um, so that's how I've been thinking about it so far. Mariche, uh, this brings us back to that question with which Shoshana Zuboff uh, is credited with. Who knows who decides, who decides, who decides? The epistemic. Mm -hmm. um, and um, you, you've probably noticed many of the tech firms are actually pushing, they keep pu posting ads saying, we want Section 230 uh, transformed, you know, reformed. 26 mm -hmm. words in Section 230 have created these giants as we know them today. It's made them possible. Um, and there is a view uh, that they want us to keep looking at that dumpster fire of const content moderation because they don't want us to be looking at the economic incentives. The, the fact that their margins are so high is because um, we pay with our data. Content moderation is the place they want us to be looking at. I just want to see how you come to this. Well, I think it's a key question because especially in the United States, it's really hard to get progress when you think about uh, disinformation only as a content issue because people immediately will refer to the First Amendment and it kind of gets the discussion stuck. Um, but as Abigail also said, and as we can see in, in the sort of evolving in the thinking around antitrust and, and data protection, is actually that these two are uh, interplaying with each other. Uh, I was very um, uh, happily surprised, or not surprised, but you know, happy to see uh, the the on the record words by Lena Khan, the FTC uh, chair, who is also a big thinker about um, reforming and updating antitrust rules. In her um, testimony on Friday, she said that she is looking actively at the relationship between antitrust, privacy, and cybersecurity. And the reason is that actually uh, there can be perverse incentives on the part of companies. For example, uh, when you look at the uh, bulk collection of data from an antitrust point of view, you, you see one set of problems. But when you look at the bulk collection of data and, for example, issues like micro-targeting of advertisements, you see another set of problems. Or if you look at the lack of data protection or uh, security measures, you stumble into yet uh, other systemic problems because data is now everywhere. The processing of data fuels new innovations like artificial intelligence. And so I'm not sure that it's even possible anymore to really look through the silos of one policy area or another. It's really important to see their interrelation. And that's why I was happy to hear Lena Khan, the top regulator in the United States, which, by the way, the big uh, Silicon Valley giants are trying to recuse. So, so much for them welcoming regulation if they don't want the top regulator to be in place. Um, but but she is really trying to connect the dots and hopefully the voice of new leadership under the Biden administration under which the U.S. will also move ahead because the U.S. has been painfully absent, I should say, in understanding that they have a, a role to play, that regulators should step in not so much to empower the state, which I think was a really important point that Abigail touched upon, but to make sure that no one has outsized power. And I think that is something deeply felt in Europe. It's at the origins of the privacy protection laws that people should primarily be protected from overreach by the state and also from overreach by companies. And, and I think that in 
in the debate about tech policy, there is often a little bit of a straw man as if regulation would automatically empower the state. Not so much. Without regulations, we wouldn't have civil rights protections. For example, we wouldn't have press freedom protections, which can also very much challenge the role of the state. And that is exactly what this is all about. No one should have unchecked power. So it's about building checks and balances, independent oversight, scrutiny of these increasingly powerful systems run by companies. What's low hanging fruit? Scrutiny and turning the lens around. Um, that's again something that came up in your conversation with you all. Um, uh, and then um, both of you discussed this thing about, you know, how all of the data will finally be sitting in China. <laughs> that's that also came up. But what is low hanging fruit based on your understanding of how Europe has been working on this? Um, and you're a dear friend of uh, Margete also. Uh, so, uh, and the Estonian Prime Minister. You, you both went to Facebook also. Uh, HQ <laughs> together. Tell yeah. us, what are the learnings from there which have not yet been applied here and which can be? Everything doesn't have to be like that big, uh, you know, a big uh, solution, small solutions. Yeah, I agree. And I think in this discussion, we'll see you see a lot of people who think that in order to tackle the many problems that uh, underregulated big tech advertising platforms cause, that we need to start from scratch somehow, that we need not just the universal human rights, but also a bill of digital rights, for example, and that we that we really need to overhaul the entire system. And you know, I understand how that can seem attractive sometimes, but at the end of the day, I think making the solutions too cumbersome will actually hinder progress. So what I see as low hanging fruit is really to build on existing laws, for example, non-discrimination principles. They are crucial. They are not controversial. They exist in the United States. You are not allowed to discriminate on the basis of, you know, skin color, sexual orientation, age, gender, and so on and so forth, religion. Uh, yet, how do we know? that algorithmic processes are actually in line with the law. And so a low hanging fruit to me is to ensure that there are verification mechanisms, oversight mechanisms to make sure that new spaces, if you want to think of the digital realm that way, are also respecting of the laws that we have worked and fought essentially, you know, decades to establish. Um, and that type of ensuring of uh, the principles that we have and to continue to see them respected will also have translations into different areas. For example, where discrimination is allowed and is not allowed also actually bears on the question of antitrust, right? Because uh, selection of, of products or ranking may not be illegal, but when it comes to price discrimination, uh, it is, it is uh, entering into the danger zone when you look through the lens of competition law. But again, how do I know as an advertiser that I've received what I've paid for. How do I know that I'm not cheated with prices that are, you know, inflated uh, illegally? Uh, how do I know that there is not um, deal makings behind the scenes, sort of cartel formings in new ways uh, between companies who have also made business to business deals as we've seen between Facebook and Google? So our existing pillars of rule of law principles, democratic principles offer enormous protections as long as they're enforced. So to make a very long story short, enforcement of existing principles is the low hanging fruit. Mm, interesting. You know, it's not in my notes for this chat, but this makes me think about how Dina Srinivasan in her paper on how Google dominates ad markets makes the same connection between financial markets and how they're regulated. And mm -hmm. why should the Google ad intermediary not be regulated the same way because the structures and the um, the mechanisms are the same. This is what you told me about, you know, how non-discrimination laws can be or should be tied in to algorithmic uh, processes. It speaks to me in the same way that paper did. I mean, it's just something that came into my uh, yeah, mind. You... One question, uh, Professor, that, you know, long ago, um, when the Microsoft case was just about uh, brewing, uh, Bill Gates said that the worst thing that could happen to him maybe 
was that he would fall down the steps of the <laughs> FTC, bump his head, and uh, maybe you know something bad will happen to him. Where have we come from there? Uh, are things moving faster? And if they're moving faster, is it in the right direction? Uh, first, uh, I'm most grateful to join this wonderful panel, and thank you for your generous invitation to participate in the discussion. I think in some ways, uh, the Microsoft case perhaps had a, a, a broader impact that Mr. Gates was concerned about, more than a slip and fall. Uh, in particular, one interesting hypothesis is that it induced Microsoft to behave somewhat more cautiously. Uh, that in particular, might they have used the desktop and Windows to crush Google or to ensure that Google operated in a way that was was amenable to Microsoft's efforts to control the flow of information. Would be we all be using Bing today instead of Googling people had there not been some greater inhibition about how Microsoft responded? Uh, and, I, and I think it's apparent, though it's hard to measure, uh, that the case was a major distraction from Microsoft. Uh, hundreds of employees became a bit more cautious channeling all of their efforts into supporting litigation instead of new product development. I think that sapped some of the company's vitality, which it's struggled, I would say, successfully to, to, to restore. But uh, I think the case probably had a bit more of an impact on his company than maybe he was joking at the time. Uh, I think the concern today is that the developments that already were extremely rapid paced, highly dynamic, have become even more so. Uh, I'm not suggesting that human beings in the past have not faced similar revolutions in communications. We only have to go back through the past 100 years or so to see that happening. But I would assert that the absolute and relative rate of change is greater than we've seen before. It puts extraordinary pressure on the capacity of government institutions to do an accurate diagnosis of what's taking place, to formulate an effective remedy, and then to implement it in a way that makes things better off. Um, given the daunting uh, nature of those challenges, uh, given the speed with which the new business structures emerge, I would say in some ways we are not as well suited today to address these phenomena than we were 20 years ago. So that uh, since you said diagnosis, let me just push on the same theme. So on July 9th, the Biden administration brought out this executive order on competition policy. And on technology, there are these three pillars, big tech platforms purchasing would-be competitors where they talk about killer acquisitions. The second is about personal information, data extraction, secret data extraction. And then finally, unfair competition with small businesses. Is that diagnosis necessarily correct? Is, how do you measure the effects uh, I think it is a good diagnosis. Uh, two things stand in the way of its realization. In many areas of public policy, we struggle to close the distance between the aspiration and its realization in practice. We have a number of public, public policies that set out admirable goals, but we fall short in the implementation of those, of those objectives. Uh, we're very good at the physics of public policy, not so good at the engineering that enables us to carry out the task at hand. So one very daunting concern is that we don't have the public administration machinery to do this concept effectively and carry it out well in practice. Um, the other is that even while I think the diagnosis is provisionally effective, it might not be six months from now or 12 months from now. And that means that as part of building an effective implementation program, we have to equip the government with the same insights, knowledge, skills, and abilities to continually update its knowledge of what's happening and respond to that. And I'm afraid as taxpayers in so many instances, we want uh, a government that performs like an elegant Mercedes sedan but we want to pay for a fully depreciated Chevrolet in order to get it. Uh, and that simply doesn't happen in our ordinary lives. I don't think it happens in public policy either. So the, the Biden executive order has, 
I think, an excellent vision, but there's such a long distance between the ideas embodied there and carrying them out in practice. And in policymaking, we tend to hide and run away instead of confronting these implementation issues directly and effectively. Poor Chevy. <laughs> Poor Chevy Van. Okay, I'm going to toss it to Mariche. Uh, um, she's the lady. If there's a headline saying, what can America learn from Europe about regulating tech? She'll be there. So I'm going to turn it to her. And Mariche, would you have questions for Professor Kovacic, considering your background? Well, I was struck by the fact that actually we are aligned in our uh, ideas about the fact that implementation and enforcement are crucial. Um, that's what I briefly mentioned before you, you joined the call as a low hanging fruit, because we have such strong principles in our laws, uh, whether it is non-discrimination or whether it is a competition and antitrust, for example. Uh, it is just a matter of making sure, or just, it's actually a complex matter, but it's an urgent matter of making sure that the uh, regulatory bodies have the mandates the skills, the resources, the people to uh, to make sure that those same principles can be enforced and probed and scrutinized in new contexts. So my question would be, realistically speaking, and with all your experience, what do you think would be needed? So let's imagine there, there are no limits. There is no budget ceiling. There are no polarizing uh, obstructions in the US Congress. What would be needed? to have the enforcement and implementation at the level that is uh, proportionate to the power of big tech in this case? Uh, it's, a, it's a wonderful question. And I'm, uh, I'm going to give myself an infinite budget and uh, <laughs> free myself from the constraints in just the way you said. Um, and I'm going to try to borrow some models that I think have worked well elsewhere. Uh, one approach that I like comes from my experience with the Competition and Markets Authority in the United Kingdom, where I'm a non-executive director on their board. Uh, over the past five years, uh, recognizing these challenges, the CMA decided that it had to build a team of computer scientists and data analytics technologists to match the skills on the outside, maybe not person per person, but that if the CMA were to do expert work in this area, both in forecasting and in assessment, it had to assemble a team that went beyond lawyers and economists. Uh, trained as a lawyer as I am, uh, I have been running away from mathematics since I was in high school. And I think this is a province where one needs real computer scientists. Uh, and to have the analytical capacity, they've built a team now that exceeds 40 people. Uh, the deputy and head of the office has her PhD in physics from Oxford. Uh, that is, these are real scientists, real computer specialists, real data analysts. And this body of skills has dramatically enhanced the capacity of the CMA to work with these issues and to formulate the approach that will be used with the digital markets unit, which is coming down the runway in the next 18 to 24 months. Uh, I'd borrow that, I'd do that, and I'd say we need that capacity inside. Uh, second is, uh, I'd be willing to spend a great deal of money. I have, uh, with, a, with a colleague, Allison Jones from uh, King's College London, uh, we proposed to the US Congress that for the next 10 years, they give the Federal Trade Commission a billion dollars a year, one billion, a big number. but with the aim that you would be able to acquire and retain some of these skills and capacities that would be needed to do the job well and to try it for 10 years uh, to see whether or not by building the depth, quality, continuity of work, you'd be able uh, to, to have teams that could match the challenges that they face on the, on the, on the outside. And, and another step I would take, I think uh, very much uh, borrows from the debate, policy analysis, and, uh, and ferment that we see taking place in the European Union. We see it in the United Kingdom and elsewhere, which is a profound discussion about whether we have the right institutional design. Mm -hmm. uh, do we have the right frameworks? Uh, I would say it's a, it's a bit humbling to realize that uh, maybe, maybe we, it's, there's experimentation involved here. Uh, and the only way in the face of some uncertainty to progress is by doing experiments. 
but I greatly admire the willingness of the commission in Brussels, uh, public authorities in the UK, in Australia, elsewhere, to step back and say, do we have the vehicle we need to do the job here? And to be willing to explore alternatives. I would deeply like to see the United States, its Congress, and its enforcement community fully integrated into that discussion and learning in real time what our counterparts abroad are doing in order to come up with a better result at home. So I'd love to have the right team, the right amount of money, and the right learning that's taking place in a variety of different settings around the world, one of the most important being Brussels. And while we have, while we wait for that right team and the right amount of money, the train wreck continues to you know, unfold. So Abigail, my colleague here, she works on content moderation. Abigail, would you like to ask the professor some questions before we wrap up? Uh, sure, thanks, thanks Nikki. Um, so as uh, Nikki mentioned, I, I work um, specifically on content moderation and online speech issues and have been trying to see how this intersects with the antitrust debate at large, but also some of the specific uh, antitrust cases um, ongoing in the U.S., particularly against Facebook, but other um, large tech companies. And so I'm curious, um, you know, one of my, my uh, main feelings about this debate is that uh, in the online speech space is that more power needs to shift back into the hands of users. And so I am curious about different models that um, enable that shift, and one of them being this sort of model that's come up under a bunch of different names. And I know that um, Mariche and others have commented and thought about this, this sort of idea that you could promote a middleware market uh, for content curation uh, software, essentially, uh, which boils down to kind of unbundling a platform's content hosting role from their content curation role, promoting more competition at the content curation layer and, and giving users more options and more control there. Um, it's my understanding that potentially an antitrust case against Facebook could help move things in this direction if a case is made that content curation is a specific market in which Facebook operates and thus their uh, hosting role needs to be separated from their curation role. But I'd be very interested to hear if the professor has any thoughts on that, on how that case is being made or, or could be made in the future. I think Abigail's assessment of that case is exactly correct, which is it does have the potential to create a competitive environment in which precisely this evolution of the sector might take place. Uh, it is a fundamental assumption of the case that if you create more competition, not simply among platforms, but in the middleware space, and if you encourage app developers to evolve in a way that create not simply complements to existing service offerings, but alternatives, substitutes, uh, you will have a renewed level of competition that will drive firms to offer users better experiences. Better, especially in the sense of more control over information about yourself, better disclosures about what happens every time you engage with the platform uh, so that you understand precisely the consequences of using the system. Uh, I think that is a fundamental assumption of the FTC case uh, the amended complaint in that case, which the FTC filed, repeatedly speaks about innovation, quality, and rivalry as crucial ingredients of creating this new market environment in the future. It doesn't talk about putting more money in the pockets of consumers. It's overwhelmingly focused on the potential for innovation to generate these alternatives. I guess a question we would have to face in the future is, will consumers understand the options being offered to them in the avalanche of information that uh, falls upon them every day, will they absorb and understand the choices that are available to them? And will they respond in the way that we hope? Uh, how do we bring to bear uh, what our colleagues in the field of behavioral economics have told us about how people understand and absorb information? So if we create this supply side possibility, Will the demand side respond in the way we want? And, and maybe that points in the direction on, uh, on uh, Marich's point before Nikki's question is, 
do we need a broader policy response that more carefully integrates the observation of people who do consumer protection from the demand side and work with the people who focus on the supply side to design remedies that once in place will function effectively because users will have better options, better disclosure, and they'll take advantage of it to make choices that genuinely make them better off. You know, Professor, but I think you've, you've captured exactly right a core assumption of the FTC Facebook case. You know, you talked about will consumers understand the choices that they eventually will have. And let's say we bring in the concept of middleware, like Mariche has written in a paper uh, co-authored with a few people. Uh, this brings us to differential privacy, essentially, right? The, the concept of differential privacy with how much uh, privacy do we want and can we choose it with middleware? Um, but these are all companies, the companies we're talking about, Facebook, uh, Instagram, um, Google, etc. Uh, they have created products which are um, which are hyper engineered at the back end, but made pretty easy to understand uh, as on the user interface side. So they are all they're all right there and in our faces and um the question to you is as we speak today the facebook whistleblower will be speaking in congress as we record this and how antitrust or its or the lack of antitrust um shows up is in these things uh, is in its effects on society it's about the neighbor i have right here next door and upstairs uh, their kids are on Instagram and the father takes a long trip from here in New York to Yosemite so that the child can experience the great outdoors. And when he came back, he tells me, but he got bored uh, because he didn't have uh, he didn't have Internet. So these are the effects we see in real life in our societies. So um, I just want maybe closing thoughts from all of you on how um, how you see this moving forward, uh, realistically, how these abstract ideas from academic papers are now taking an activist approach, and how far will that, uh, do you see that going? What lessons from history should we remember? Um, maybe Professor Kowesik first, and then Mariche and Abigail. One thing that is daunting about the traditional antitrust technology of lawsuits Abigail's focus on the Facebook case is to realize that that process is going to move very slowly. Today is the deadline for Facebook to file its response, further response to the FTC's case, and they will probably seek once again the dismissal of the case. Sometime in the spring, I suppose the judge will say the FTC can proceed. He will then set a schedule for the case. But it is likely that that case will not begin the trial phase itself until perhaps the late part of 2023. That's over two years from now. And then the trial will take a year. The inevitable appeals might take two or three years. We're moving into the into the not just the middle, but the the later stage of the decade before we get an, uh, an answer there. To me, uh, it has the feeling of riding a bicycle trying to catch up with a Formula One racer. Uh, so uh, a core question is, is that technology fit for this purpose? So do we have to work much more effectively in a way that brings together the skills and disciplines of a disparate collection of public institutions, forms good partnerships with academic hubs that are doing lots of the relevant work and persuading our public legislatures that it's worth spending money on this. That is, if this is, as we've said so often, been identified as the issue of our lives, perhaps that's climate. Okay, maybe the second most important issue of our lives. If it is, and everything is at stake from the way we live, our ability to participate in a democratic system, What's that worth to us? Is that not worth a few more euros here and there to make it work? So I think I think this is a point at which uh, to answer this question, we have to confront uh, in an honest and effective way the question of whether we care enough about these questions 
to establish the institutions that are up to addressing them effectively? Like and I don't know the answer to that question. Well, I agree that that is the question. And, and also, you know, what kind of tools do we think are best fit to deal with those big societal democracy impacting questions? And it strikes me, you know, this session is about competition, antitrust uh, tools, market tools, essentially, that we often look to market tools because those are the ones that we have. But I think democracy is worth protecting head on, you know, not to hope that as a side effect of uh, indeed lengthy uh, cases in, in uh, the context of competition law, we would hopefully see less disinformation and less polarization, but that we will also begin to dare thinking about uh, what is needed to actually put democracy first and not put markets and market tools first. And, and I think that in that context, there's also real importance to acknowledge societal harms, not just harms to the individual or, you know, the uh, empowerment of choice for the individual consumer, because there, there are many effects that we see now coming from the outsized power of uh, tech companies that are really hard to pigeonhole back to one individual. And uh, I agree with the words of the professor that uh, it's hard to, to navigate as an individual internet user slash consumer slash citizen who has no insight into all the systems that they're subject to. Uh, and to then, even if they're as empowered as can possibly be, make the right choices. So there is a role for government to protect the public interest and there should be resources available. And I think, we cannot stress enough the magnitude of the problems that we're facing, and perhaps that will then free up the resources that are needed. Uh, I mean, I certainly agree with the with the sentiments being expressed here that um, you know waiting on on slow antitrust lawsuits is not going to solve a lot of these problems, and there's um, an urgent need, I would say, for uh, governments to invest and be thoughtful about the kind of regulation that is needed, um, you know, in the immediate term. Uh, and I, I agree with Marietje, there is absolutely um, a, a role for government here. Um, I, I guess I look at this uh, as I hear different politicians in the U.S. particularly make proposals and uh, within the content and online speech space in particular, get a little uh, concerned about this like two-sided struggle for power and, and want to emphasize what what she said about putting democracy first and putting uh, you know the the rights of users and citizens before um, both corporate and and I guess uh, governmental authoritarianism um, so yeah professor Kovacic, uh this is just too tempting so I'm going to give you the last word you talked about a bicycle a Chevy van, a Mercedes Benz, um, a Formula One car, and the I distance- spent my childhood in Detroit, Michigan, so I have a child's fascination for things that make lots of noise and go fast. Sorry. Yeah. So I, I love it. So uh, we talked about all this, and then earlier in our background chat, you'd mentioned you said you know it's it's all very well to stand uh, to sit on the sidelines and comment on a sports game, but how about you know, why don't you get onto the field and play? It's dirty, it's rough, it's it's hard. So between the bicycle and the Mercedes-Benz or the Formula One, uh, midway, what are the solutions that are, that you can see, um, that you can imagine? Uh, one is to take the insight that Maretcha mentioned about the broader conversation that identifies the larger array of values that we want to protect and ensure that those who have worked in thinking about those public institutions that have a role of them role in them are joined up together in collaborative efforts uh and and i see a number of heartening signs that that's happening i see that in the uk and the relationships between the cma ofcom and the data protection authority I see that uh, in the Biden executive order that we referred to that calls for a whole of government approach to addressing problems. Uh, uh, you know, that's the right attitude. Uh, um, although I realize that government agencies do not always and naturally see each other as allies. Uh, and, and, 
and and it, and and the the relationships, the synapses do not emerge automatically. Uh, they require a nurturing, continuing effort. But but that's a that's a useful approach. And and I think uh, as uh, from that uh, comes a better understanding of all of the dimensions of the problem, and a better idea of the combination of tools that might be brought to bear upon solving them. And I mean, my hopeful observation is. I hear lots of public officials and participants in the supporting intellectual infrastructure outside of government thinking about this in a very creative and thoughtful way. Uh, that gives me hope that that there that there could be good answers and answers that are attuned to all the implementation problems we're talking about. Thank you so much.